Today I'm going to talk to Father Jervis de Souza. He was in our parish in 1997 and he's back here with us. But a lot has changed since then. So let's find out. Come with me. Father, you were the Deputy Secretary General of the Catholic Bishops Conference of India, CBCI. How did working closely with bishops from across India shape your understanding of diverse challenges facing the church in different regions? At the start, I'd like to thank His Eminence, Cardinal Oswald Gracious, for giving me this opportunity. You know, the whole of India is divided into 14 regions, different dioceses, 174 dioceses. And every time a bishop would come or bishops would come to our CBCI center, they would bring with them their joys, their challenges, their struggles. Like for example, a big challenge of the MP bishops. Okay. There was always constant persecution and we spent many tense moments at our CBCI center, mainly because Delhi being the center, news reporters, press reporters would always come to our gate and ask me for a bite, whatever. And then invariably, that was used as a discussion for a number of TV channels, whatever. So we had a policy that we would always get in touch with the grassroots, the bishop who's there at the local level to find out what really was the problem. Why was one church vandalized? Why were some statues broken down? Why were some teachers beaten up? Why were there something going on which was not keeping in harmony what our church teaches us and wants us to live in our country. With your 15 years of experience as judge and judicial vicar and having supported multiple dioceses in Delhi, Agra, Chandigarh and Shimla with can canonical matters, what do you see as the most important aspect of the canonical law in guiding the church's mission and addressing the pastoral needs of the faithful? Yeah. So with regard to canon law, you know, sometimes whenever we talk to people and they say, they say, oh, the laws of the church are so tiresome and burdensome and the priests are always putting burdens and obstacles around our neck. But I want to share with you, my dear friends, that the code of canon law is a liberating book because if we follow those rules, simple rules which you and I have to abide by, Life will be so easy and peaceful and it takes care from the time we are born to not only to the time we die, but even after that. But I'll give you a simple example while we are living. Take for example, a boy and a girl come and they say they want to get married. Now the church has to make proper inquiries. I mean, we just do not allow them to get married overnight, whatever. And I always tell them when I conduct the marriage preparation course, when I, that the church, precisely because the church likes and loves the faithful, the church is concerned and wants to protect your marriage, lest anything happens to after the honeymoon, so that if anyone comes to question them, we can always say that we have made a proper search, a proper inquiry. What were some memorable moments or experiences during your time as Director of Orientation Program at St. Pius? 10th college and how do you continue to mentor and guide seminarians or young clergy today? Yeah, I must say those two years at Goregao Seminary St. Pius were really beautiful years because I as a priest was in charge of the orientation year or the propodactic year when the boys just joined. So it was like what you say the KG class or the first standard. <clears throat> it was their formation time and I lived with them. I also visited their homes because I firmly believe when we visit someone's home, we can get to know the person in a fuller and a broader context. And we grew so close because not only imparting to them scripture, word of God or Vatican II documents, but whole Christian life, Christian values and helping these young men to make a good and a proper decision for life. And that is why even now in different parishes, we always have to encourage our young priests, encourage our seminarians. That is why when anyone or everyone asks, Father, what you want? I say, I don't want anything material. Pray for us, priests and seminarians, because that is what we all look forward to.
As the coordinator of the social apostolate, what are your primary goals for addressing the most pressing social issues in our community? And, and how can parishioners get involved? Yeah, so I am now in charge of the social work of the diocese along with Bishop Alvin De Silva. And I must say, my dear friends, from June till today, it's such a fulfilling experience because the Archdiocese of Bombay under the social apostolate takes care of migration, migrants, takes care of environment, takes care of the prison ministry. And we have a number of our parishes across Bombay Arch <coughs> Archdiocese, what is called a community center. The community center is the social outreach wing of the diocese of every parish. Every parish has what is called a church where we gather for worship. But that is not all. A Lord wants us also to reach out to the poor and the needy. And every month we have what is called a FCCO meeting, Federation of Community Centers Organization. And Bishop Alvin De Silva, in, with all his intelligence and past experience, has what is called a training program for our social workers, for our sisters, who are leaders and directors of these community centers where we are constantly in touch with so many social issues, garbage problem, getting voter ID cards, sometimes some, someone's property is taken away, someone's land is taken away. So every day we are in touch in and through these community centers with these social issues. And our parish also can surely get involved. Our parish has so much of talent, so much of wealth where we can use it for taking care of the poor and needy in our parish as well as outside. How has your role as joint administrator of the clergy home influenced your perspective on the needs of priests and religious and what initiatives are the most are you most focused on? When I was in Delhi, I've never dreamt of working in the clergy home where we have our senior priests. But let me say till today it has been a really satisfying and a fulfilling job, a fulfilling ministry, interacting, working, talking, sitting down with 14 of our senior priests who are there. When they speak, when they share their experiences, I realize what a wealth of experience they have. For example, recently on October 24th, we celebrated the birthday of our senior most priest, Father Jude Pereira. He was 95 years old and another priest, Father Rock Gonsalves. And when I total the number of years they were as priests, it comes to 110 years of priestly ministry. I was privileged that day to celebrate the Eucharist for them. And I told both the priests and the other priests over there, just imagine in 110 years of priestly ministry, how many baptisms they must have done, how many marriages they must have done, how many people they must have buried. Everyone started laughing. But that is where we touch people's lives. And the life of a diocesan priest is so enriching when we always in touch with people. In your years of ministry, what has been the most transformative experience for you personally? And how has it shaped your approach to pastoral leadership? Yeah. <clears throat> Few instances come to my mind. <clears throat> One for that matter clearly stands out when I was working here in the Bandra Tribunal. A couple one day came in my office and of course first few minutes I allow them to speak because we really do not know what brings them to the tribunal. And after some time I asked them, what is your purpose for taking an appointment and coming to meet me today? And what they shared really struck me, which has happened so many years ago, but it is etched in my heart and in my head. They had separated many years ago. They had got their civil divorce. They had got their church annulment. And now they were coming together to get married once again in the church, only because their daughter was now in the 10th standard. And they said, Father, we want to be with our daughter. That really touched me. And I said, surely, I will get your papers organized and help you all to get married. Another beautiful example, which in, our minis in my ministry, 
was when I was at Victoria Church, we used to go around on First Friday communion. And I had left that parish in 2000, 2001, whatever. And many years after that, <clears throat> when I was at Bishop's house from 2008 onwards to 2010, one man, a man comes to my office over there and he says that, Father, you will not remember me. But many years ago, when you were at Victoria Church, you used to give my mother communion. And then he took out from his bag an invitation card. He said, in a few weeks from now is my mom's 90th birthday and I want you to be there. That really touched me. In fact, these are the joys of our priesthood. And they are so much part and parcel of my life. I went over and I was there present for that elderly lady's birthday. I mean, none of how many of us would remember what we did yesterday or who we met and spoke yesterday. But this lady remembered me and it was such a touching experience, which in a way helps me. In fact, our lay faithful are our strength and energy, which helps us to give off more, to give off our best for our people. Uh, looking forward, what are your aspirations for the future of the diocese social outreach and pastoral initiatives? And how do you envision the role of St. Andrew's Parish in this mission? I'm happy to be back at St. Andrew's because I was here also in 1997. And I must say, St. Andrew's is an extremely rich and bubbling parish. Rich, not just financially. Yes, they are financially rich. But every community, every place that I go and visit, every family, every building, every society, there's so much of talent among our children, among our youth. And for me, one classic example which stands out about this parish is the zonals that we have from mid-August right up to the start of September. During that time, you go on any weekend to the St. Andrews Auditorium and you will see the wealth of talent over there. In fact, I've invited some of those performing artists also to come to our clergyman to entertain our priests, whatever. So, we can contribute so much and when I say contribute, I don't only mean finances. There's so much of talent here. There's so many of our young people who today are brilliant, excellent experts in various and different fields. And today with the digital technology and with AI, our people can do wonders, not only for our parish, for also the diocese, the needy and the poor, where we can reach out and help them.